think that's been a really helpful session. Thank you so much to everybody um, for coming. Um, we've got to handle this really carefully, and the message that I'm going to be keen that we work together to get out is that our surgeons and cardiologists in this country are as good as anywhere in the world. That has to be the message that we're aiming for. My worry, if I'm quite frank, is that the media are going to look for some kind of feeding frenzy on, under the headline of outliers. And that is going to require some difficult handling, and it's a kind of media reality that there may be some difficulty there. So the more that all of us can do to counter the argument by using this as an opportunity to demonstrate that our NHS is good, that the people that work in it are good, and that the outcomes are good, um, is going to be, I think, uh, really important. So Norman's point, I think, is really good. It's, it's one thing to say we're good, but we need to use this in the way that Ben has described um, as a starting point for the pursuit of excellence. So why is pursuit of excellence about the individuals? Some of you will know that one of my tasks at the moment is to, um, is to have a process for looking at the 14 hospitals in the country that have the highest uh, mortality. One of the things that has become clear to me during the course of that, we find really good pockets of good practice in all of them, and we find pockets of less good practice. But I've come to the view hospitals are just a piece of real estate, They're just a building. And then inside that building, there are a bunch of people who come together to try and ensure that the private and privileged and personal interaction between a patient and a clinician works well, whether you're running the IT, whether you're running the HR, um, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a nurse or a physiotherapist. And therefore, hospitals are the, how a hospital performs is simply an aggregate of how well the individual clinical teams perform. And within the clinical teams, they're an aggregate of how well each of the individuals perform. And one of the, the things also that came to me out of that when I, I was involved in a number of different levels in, in what went on in Bristol was the unit results for the surgeons were published. This was for adult cardiac surgery. This never got into the media. It never got into the final Bristol report. But the results for coronary artery surgery were good for the unit. In fact, they were, they were if my memory serves me correctly, slightly better than average. But there was one surgeon in that group who had an 11% mortality for coronary surgery for, for low-risk cases. And that was obscured by the fact that the other guys were just excellent. And so we need to just kind of think that through in the pursuit of excellence. So if we can get every individual thinking about their practice, thinking about what they do, you've raised the issue about, about cherry picking. And it has been an issue of discussion for years in the specialty in which I worked, concern about it. But what it has done is it's focused people's minds on picking the right patients. And whilst there may be some people who are really concerned and, and will avoid high-risk cases, the option exists for a second opinion, and that we've had written into the NHS Constitution. But it also stops people taking risks with other people's lives. It, 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 it in invokes, I think, a, uh, a much greater level of thought at the high-risk end of the spectrum. So what is this going to bring? I think this will bring value through a number of different ways. It will bring value through revalidation, and Ben showed that pretty well. It's already participation in clinical audits. Not everybody will know this, but it's already written into the filtering system for clinical excellence awards. So if there is a clinical... Ex if there is a... Uh, a national clinical audit in your specialty and you are not submitting to it, then don't bother submitting your application because it will be filtered out. Um, there is the opportunity here for, um, for service development, using the state for service development. And 
When we get to a really good place, there, we will have, I think, the opportunity for live tracking of performance. And the end result of live tracking of performance is that you spot things early and we won't end up with the sort of outliers which are our starting position now. And that's going to be a journey, and it's only something that we can do. There isn't another group somewhere else working out how to do that. I think that's down to us. That's the issue of, of clinical leadership. And can I just put, throw a word of warning about risk adjustment? I've made a bit of a career out of risk adjustment in the past. Um, but, you know, I get the mathematics of it and all of that kind of stuff and the statistics. One thing that struck me working with colleagues in, in North America on this and to some extent in this country is the more you advertise how good your risk adjustment is, the more people assume that the final figure is the answer. And if your risk adjustment is okay or you don't have any risk adjustment and somebody gets fingered, they always have the opportunity to say, come and have a look. Come in and have a look. And um, that's really important because when people come and have a look, they can make an, a, a pretty good value assessment of your performance, your performance within the organization um, and how the organization is, is helping you. If, if you advertise that your risk adjustment is spot on, um, then they assume they don't have to go and have a look and that the answer comes from the numbers. So I think we've got a few things to do um, that have come out of the conversation. One, Amir, is let trusts know in advance. I think we need to work on a no surprises principle here. And I'm sorry, the time frame just has driven this a bit quicker than many people would have liked. Um, but I think we need to make sure that trust medical directors know what's going on so that they aren't um, um, caught unawares. We clearly need to do some work on the confidentiality side of things with particular respect to, uh, to people's health. But I think, Claire, I think that's really a trust issue. So the outlier might come out as an outlier. Why they're an outlier is an issue for the trust to, to handle. Um, and we still have some work to do, Karen, on the, um, on the relationship with CCGs. Because I think that's going to be really important for, for driving this forward. So I was taken by a comment of a colleague when we were going through these arguments some years ago who popped up and said, um, you know, the best way to protect the patient, to, to protect the surgeon, is to protect the patient. And I found that quite a profound statement. And then for those who think that somehow or other this might be stoppable, um, there was a, a colleague who Ben and I know well who was vehemently opposed opposed to this, absolutely vehemently opposed. And he happened to be the president of the, of the cardiac surgeons at one point. And then the expenses scandal in Parliament broke. And it completely transformed him because he realized the, the drift towards transparency and public disclosure and accountability and all of that. And he suddenly realized that he wanted to know whether his MP was fiddling the expenses, not just the average fiddling rate. Um, so that was quite an interesting point. So my plea to people is, I think we've got some pioneering stuff going on here. We've seen people who are brave. There are going to be people who are really frightened about this, not necessarily because they're frightened about their own data, but because they're frightened of the way other people will interpret it and the other people will ex exploit it for their own ends. But we have to dive into that swimming pool that, uh, that Moira showed. We have to show the leadership on this. Um, and the furore will die down quite quickly. Um, I had a massive row with, um, with the Times at one point because they published heart surgery outcomes. It was a double-page spread. It was a massive graph in color. The Department of Health had contributed to it without telling, telling us, and it was all pretty nasty. The next year, it was in whatever point the Times use, 10-point font in alphabetical order, and people had lost interest. And um, 
this will, as a media story, will die down quite quickly. And once that's died down, the, the pursuit of excellence really begins. And so I would encourage you to do what's right, to be brave, and to show real clinical leadership in our NHS. Thank you.